Thank you very much for, for your kind introduction and for the invitation. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you said, I'm Loris and I'm from um, EMPA today and EPFL actually. And I will be talking about a bit physics-inspired deep learning and reinforcement learning for building control. So in general, there is something that's coming for us, um, a little thing that's called climate change. So we, we have to do something about it and we have to decrease our emissions. And this also means that we have to decrease our energy consumptions. And in Switzerland, buildings consume like 40% of the end use energy. So they're really key players. We need to find solutions to decrease their energy intensity. And there are basically three main ways we can do that, right? So we can design better buildings from scratch, or we can take existing buildings and just improve their controllers to make them smart buildings. Or we can use um, retrofit um, to increase the efficiency of older buildings, let's say. And if the sustainability argument is not enough for you, you can also look actually at the cost of a building. And a lot of costs actually happen during the usage of the building. And a big chunk of it over there um, in red is actually energy. So by decreasing the energy uh, consumption, we actually also improve the costs and um, allow people to save money if sustainability is not, sustainability is not enough. Um, and so in this talk, I will focus on the, the little red um, panel there uh, on the control applications. Uh, but actually, whatever you want to do with buildings, the first thing you need to, uh, is a model. Um, because buildings are very slow systems and you just can't experiment everything. So typically, if you want your controller to work in summer and in winter, so you can be very patient and wait six months, or you have to somehow find a simulation and test it to make sure that it works in all kinds of situations. And so in this talk, when I talk about models, I mean a model of the temperature, how the temperature is evolving in your building, so that afterwards we can actually minimize the energy consumption while maintaining the temperature um, at acceptable levels for the occupants. All right, so um, now we need a model of our buildings. Uh, how, how do we do that? So the first thing you can do, and the classical way to go about it, is to start from the physics, right? Thermodynamics has been around for hundreds of years. Everybody knows how it works. You can just write your physical laws down, find all the parameters, and you will have your model. And uh, of course, the nice thing is that it, it's right. Um, you know that it's, it, the solution will make sense, kind of. And the problem, however, is that you have quite a large engineering overhead. So you need to know your physics well, you need to find all the parameters from technical sheets or find a way to identify them from data or whatever. So it can take a lot of time. And in general, it might not be that much of a problem. Like if you are in, in an industrial process, for example, it might be worth it to just invest a few months in designing a very good model that you can then reuse many, many, many times. Um, but then the problem with buildings is that you can't do that because all of them are different. So if you take a few months to design a good model for one building and then you want to go to the next building, you have to start from scratch. So that's not very ideal and um, this is why this engineering overhead is becoming more and more of an issue. And so in the, in the past years, with the fact that we have more and more data that is available in our buildings, um, people started to say, okay, can we leverage that data? And this is where machine learning comes into play. Um, can you actually design black box models of those buildings? And so this will be the first part of, of my talk. I will um, especially talk about neural networks and how you can use neural networks to build uh, models of your buildings. And then in the second part, I will briefly mention one application that, that, that you can have afterwards um, to design controllers with reinforcement learning to actually now save energy and kind of reach the goal that we need to reach somehow. So, okay, let, let, let's start. The first thing you need to do um, when you try a new model usually is to have a baseline, right? You, you need to compare it to something to make sure that you're actually doing something that's useful. So here I just took a very classical model. I don't want to go into the details. It's just the classical model that you use um, from physics, which is um, called an RC model. And um, this is the kind of result that you get, right? So it makes sense if you heat a lot in red below, then the temperature will go very high over three days in your building. And um, in, on the contrary, if you start to cool in blue, then the temperature will um, slowly draw, drop. So that's just um, following our intuition. I, I guess we can all agree on that. So then um, after we have this baseline, we can actually fit um, a model to the data we have. 
And so, as mentioned, we want to use neural networks. And here I'm using actually LSTMs, so long short-term memory networks, because they're really good um, for time series data to capture time dependencies and so on. And it turns out that they do have a great accuracy. So it's kind of a good news, right? We, we know from our experience in many, many fields that neural networks are really great um, to feed data. And they do it as well on our data set. Uh, so then, now we have our model, let's just use it. And now we have a little issue. Um, I hope we can agree that that's not really what we want. Uh, so the, the neural network somehow fitted the data, but not in a good way. And actually, I hope many of you managed to join the keynotes yesterday, because two of them actually spoke of this, right? So this is the famous generalization issue of neural networks. So yesterday evening, we saw some example on um, actually computer vision tasks. Um, and we saw also that neural networks are sometimes able to find shortcuts. So here the neural network just forgot about the cooling or heating power and just found a good way to fit the data just out of nowhere, kind of. So yeah, uh, generalization is not only an issue in computer vision, it can also happen in time series data, for example. And you have to be very careful about it. And actually, um, in my case, since I'm focusing on buildings, I would say that it's kind of always the case because the data is in inherently incomplete, right? You're forced to cool in summer and heat in winter, and you cannot have temperatures of 30 degrees inside, or you won't cool in December. So all those situations won't happen in reality, usually on your historical data. So then when you try to fit a model, it won't know how to react um, to that kind of new input. And of course, in our case, that's not acceptable um, for control applications. So we have to find a solution to this problem. I mean, you can't even distinguish between heating and cooling. Um, how do you want to control that building, right? So, um, and the idea is, of course, to get back to what we know, right? The first step was to actually create a classical model. Um, and we, have, we are quite lucky because we know a lot about the physics. So can we somehow implement that in our models, right? And this is why we proposed um, physically consistent neural networks, or PCNNs, which are a new type of physics-inspired neural networks um, that you might know. So usually in physics-inspired neural networks, you tweak the loss function of your network to drive it to physically consistent solution. And here instead we will change the structure of the network itself to make it consistent by design somehow. And the idea is that we would like to retain this nice um, consistency, this nice physical consistency on the top right that we know is true from, from our intuition and from the physics, but we would also like to leverage this great accuracy uh, that neural networks are able to, to get. So I, I don't want to go into the details here, but, and it's a bit hard to see, but basically what we have now is we separated the prediction into two latent variables, and on the top one, the top module, is just a classical neural network, which is just taking care of everything you don't know. Everything you don't really know how to model, you just feed it to whatever neural network structure you want with LSTMs or whatever you, you want in there. And it models, for example, um, the impact of the sun on the temperature or the impact of the occupants, for example, which are really hard to grasp um, from a physical, physical point of view. But then, in parallel, we have this physics-inspired module. So in our case, it turned out to be a linear module, but you could expand it and do whatever you want. The point is that in there you can treat um, what you know um, with physics, right? And so in our case, we have, for example, that if the temperature outside or in the neighboring room is lower, then you will have heat losses, right? If it's cold outside, you will just lose heat to the outside. And so we remove this energy from the latent variable. And on the contrary, if you start heating um, with this input U here, then you will add energy to your system. So this latent variable E is kind of capturing the physics. It's kind of accumulating or dissipating energy according to what's happening um, and following our physical intuition. And then you let both these latent variables evolve through time and you can just sum them to get your um, final temperature prediction at the end. And the nice thing about it is that it's actually everything is implemented together and it's learned together. So it's not like your typical gray box modeling where you first start with one part and then you add the other one on top, for example. And um, it, it's really everything is learned together. So even the parameters of the physics-based model, now you don't even need to know them. Um, you can learn them from the data together with 
the nonlinear module. This is what uh, makes it very powerful. And once you have the architecture, you just need to plug in data and let it learn. So um, the nice thing, as I mentioned, is that we can actually formally prove its physical consistency. So if you're really bored, you can write down the equations and you can check by yourself um, or you can read the paper. And you can show that whatever happens, if you turn on heating, you will get higher temperatures afterwards, which makes sense, right? But um, so instead of showing you the equations, I can actually um, showing it, uh, show it graphically. So this was what we had before, right? And now with this um, proposed PCNNs, we actually now get um, something that resembles um, what we wanted. It also makes sense because in our case, the physics-inspired module that we used is actually a simplified RC model. So it makes sense that the dynamics are very, very close. So now the question is, what, what do you gain by doing that? And um, the answer is when you actually look at the accuracy of the model, because it fits the data much better. So you can see in green that the error of the PCNN is much, much lower than the classical model. So we now have used neural networks in a physical, consistent way, um, but we also leverage the expressiveness of neural networks to kind of um, decrease the error of the model over the horizon. So especially, as you can see, towards the end of the horizon, um, because we are using LSTMs and they're really good at um, time dependencies and long-term dependencies, they get much better. Okay, so that's um, our proposition on how to use neural networks for building models um, while retaining a bit of physical consistency. And so, as promised, um, now that we have the models, we can actually look at how to use them to actually save energy in the real world, right? And so for that, we propose to use deep reinforcement learning, which is just one of the many control techniques um, that can be used. And the way it works is that you have an agent on, on the right that's kind of interacting with your building, right? And at each time step, the agent observes what's, ha what's happening and decides what to do, right? And then it is rewarded for it. So we are basically telling the agent how good or bad um, the decisions was. And then by iteratively, um, iteratively interacting with the building, the agent will learn to maximize the reward and hence to take the best actions as possible. So in our case, um, we replace the buildings with our simulation environment, as mentioned, because you, you just can't let the agent learn for years on the building, right? You need to accelerate the process. And in our case, the, the observations are also quite simple. It's just past uh, temperatures in your building, past weather data, and the current temperature bound, so this lower bound and upper bound, because we want to maintain the temperature into these user-defined bounds in practice, right? You don't want the temperature to drop too low. And then the agent decides what to do, in our case, heating or cooling. Um, and of course, the reward function is also quite intuitive, although it might look a bit cryptic here, but the last term is basically penalizing energy consumption, right? So we want our agent to be penalized each time it's using energy. And the first two terms are just penalizing the agent if the temperature goes out of the bounds. So if it's too high or too low, we also penalize the agent. So that after learning, the agent will have, hopefully, uh, picked up the right behaviors to maintain the temperature between, behind the, between the bounds but minimizing the energy consumption. And so actually we took this, this kind of agent and we let it run for, for a while. And afterwards um, you can look at what happens in simulation when you let the agent run. So the, the bounds now, the temperature bounds are the dotted lines, right? And we also have two um, baseline controllers in red and orange that you can kind of forget about for now. The interesting part is that we can also compute the optimal trajectory. A posteriori, if once everything has happened and since we're in simulation in a perfect world, we can just optimize for the optimal trajectory. And you can compare that uh, to the green line, which is our agent. And it's actually quite surprising and we were quite astonished to see that the agent picked up a behavior that is really, really close to optimal. And um, this is something that was still quite an open question uh, concerning reinforcement learning. It's always a bit hard to say what it does in the end. So here we can see actually that it does really, really good. It's pretty close to the optimum. And I mean, qualitatively, the solution looks, um, looks really good to me at least. And it picked up really interesting behaviors like preheating. You can see that it starts heating earlier so that it's, it's sure the temperature is high enough when the bounds get tightened and that kind of stuff. And you, I mean, the agent doesn't know, it doesn't predict anything, right? It only knows what's happening now. 
and still it's able to learn really interesting behaviors. And so that's just one example, but you can run this analysis for thousands of sequences, which is what we do did. And um, those are a lot of numbers, but basically you can see that the agent is always close to the optimal and it's always crushing the baselines. So in our case, we got like energy improvements of 30 to 40% compared to the baselines. And you can see that also in terms of comfort, uh, we got much, much less comfort violations. Um, so it's really impressive to see that reinforcement learning is actually able to come to, let's say, near optimal solutions without any predictive power. Uh, but still, that's only simulation, right? So it's, it's one last step that we needed to take. And um, luckily, we have this possibility uh, at EMPA, where I work. Uh, so we could actually deploy it in the real building and control. So it's just one bedroom for now, but we can control this bedroom. And we could also deploy the baseline in another bedroom to compare what's, what's happening. And um, actually, when you look at the results, again, um, you can see that it's pretty close to what we saw in simulation. So this is, on, on the one hand, the good news is that PCNN seem to be a, quite a good simulation model because they give dynamics that really resembles what we have in reality and that the reinforcement learning algorithm also picked up meaningful behaviors because it's doing the same thing, um, staying really close to the lower bound, preheating a little bit, um, and so on and so forth. And actually, yeah, you can't see it because somehow the shaded area disappeared this here um, is actually we lost the connection for a little while and the, and the default controller took over. And you can see that it starts heating right away with full power. So it's kind of comparable to our baseline. So the baseline might l look a bit stupid, but it's actually pretty close to default controllers that you can see in buildings. And um, yeah, from that you can see that our agent is actually really improving upon existing baselines um, quite clearly. All, uh, but I mean, like if you compute the numbers, you get that we actually um, saved 63% of energy, but that's a number that I would not uh, trust very much. I mean, it's a very easy case. The temperature was, I mean, there was almost no action required. Uh, so I would take it with, with care, um, but qualitatively we see that the same thing as in simulation is happening. So I would say that saving 30 to 40% of energy with that kind of algorithm should be possible in reality. And yes, yeah, so with that, I would like to, to wrap up a bit. Um, I think we can agree that building control will be necessary um, in the energy transition. We have to do something. We have to decrease their energy consumption. And when data is available, we should definitely uh, try out to use black box models and neural networks. So then in the first part, we saw that black box models can be really misleading. So please be careful, <laughs> I would say, because I've seen many papers just applying neural networks and then don't discussing this, or they're not discussing this issue of physical consistency. And it might be a, um, a big problem in general. Uh, and then we propose these PCNNs as one potential solution. Again, there are like many works um, existing with different architectures and different ways to do it. This is just one of the solutions um, we, find we have. And one nice thing is that it's quite easy to scale. Um, if you have a big building with many rooms, you can easily just copy paste it kind of everywhere and learn everything from data. You don't need to write down equations with tens of variables and I don't know what to, to represent your system. Um, so altogether, we kind of avoid tedious engineering uh, thanks to these kind of methods. And then in the second part, we just sh um, saw one possible application, uh, one possible controller through reinforcement learning, which kind of proved that PCNNs are good simulation environments. And kind of as, a, as an annex result, we actually saw that reinforcement learning works really well. And it's actually able to go to near optimal solutions and to save energy, um, let's say, of roughly 30% or 40% of energy, while also improving the, the comfort of the occupants in general. And um, actually, if you look at it as, as, a, as a whole, what we have is a fully black box pipeline. So you don't need to know anything about your building, about the orientation, about yeah, you don't need to know anything, basically, about the physics either, right? If you have data, you can just feed the data, feed the, the, the PCNN, use the PCNN to learn your controller, and just deploy your control policy, and you might already have achieved 30% of energy savings. So we, we kind of have these plug-and-play controllers, um, although, of course, I, I've brushed many details under the carpet, so it's like, 
it, it's a bit of a leap, but let's say that it's a good, good step towards plug and play controllers um, in general. And of course for us uh, now we are working on expanding it and just using it to model entire buildings, to model different buildings. And then uh, the next step of course is once you have a very good model of your building and you want to optimize it, um, then you should look at PV production on, on the roof, at energy storage, at electric vehicles, um, towards buildings as prosumers, right? Because that will be kind of key and I think we, it has been kind of a, a theme in, in the track today that we will have to play, everybody has to play together. But this could be a way to get a very good model of the behaviors of buildings and um, how to control them. And yeah, with that, I would like to, to thank you for your attention. I was a bit over time, but I started a bit early, so I hope that's fine. And uh, <laughs> if you want more technical details, you can just check the, the two papers, the submitted versions are, are an archive. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for the contribution. Uh, we already have lots of questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering how your model handles things like Windows opening, uh, and if that really upsets the results. Thank you for the question. It's a good, it's a good question. So currently, um, it doesn't, uh, simply because we don't know when the windows are open. Now, if you have data about it, then you can just model it, model it inside. So if you want, you can either put it in the physical module, um, which might be useful or not, or you can just let it um, learn in, inside the neural network. And that's also the power of this kind of approach, that everything you don't know, if you have some information, you can just let the neural network learn about it. So in another application that I don't have here, um, we applied it to another building where we additionally um, have electrical measurements. So for example, this is kind of a proxy for occupancy. And we feed that also inside the neural network to kind of, if you, you know that if the kitchen is using electricity, then somebody's there. And it, it also changes the dynamics a bit. Um, the question then is how much do you gain uh, out of it? And that's still an open question. But uh, yeah, the nice thing is that it's very modular. So you can just feed it, um, feed any data that you have. Thanks for your talk. I have a question regarding at the beginning of your talk, you were explaining how each building is different. And then uh, I would like to ask you your reinforcement learning model would you believe that it would work in a totally different uh, building, or you will have it to retrain it every time for each uh, building? And in that case, do you think it's feasible? Um, yes, thank you for your, for your question. Um, yes, currently we would have to retrain it. So you would need to have some new data for the new building, and then you can just fit the, the, the whole pipeline. Um, now there is a big trend in transfer learning, if you've heard about it, which, um, should able, enable you to transfer these, these controllers between buildings more and more um, efficiently. But currently we don't have that, uh, so you'd have to, to retrain it. However, like, since it works really well on, and we also try, like, um, when we model the other building, we also train the reinforcement learning on it, and we can see the same um, energy savings in simulation. So it, it looks like it's pretty general. Just a rising question, um, how long does the retraining take? Um, so that's, it depends. So this one, for, for this one, actually the, the model was quite big. Um, we, we tried something big. But if you pick smaller models, um, I mean, you need a GPU to train the model. Uh, that's one problem. And it takes, I don't know, 12 hours or maybe a day with a lot of data. So we use very, very, a lot of data to, to try that. But then the reinforcement learning is actually like six hours on my laptop. So it's, the reinforcement learning part is quite easy. Hi. Um, currently, there are a lot of existing building control systems already like Honeywell. How is your um, method methodology prediction uh, differ from that um, available on the market? You mean in terms of model of, or controllers? Uh, in, in terms of your model and, and the algorithm that you apply for it? Um, so as you said, there are many, many, many possibilities. Um, to be honest, we, for now we only compare to this RC model. 
um, because that's the only one that's easy to implement. So that's, that was also the, the motivation in the introduction. It's a large engineering overhead. Like you have a lot of transit models or energy plus for buildings, um, but I mean, it takes weeks to calibrate those models. So it's really hard to compare, I would say. Um, but we are also looking into it. And especially there are some libraries now that are coming um, to kind of standardize that kind of test because you need to have the same data. So this means that you, you cannot compare to something else in the literature. You need to implement it yourself and then use the same data, same setup, and then you can compare. And this is the main problem, I would say. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it was really impressive on the long term. You have very, uh, very be much better uh, prediction accuracy, but I saw in a, in a very short window in the beginning, the traditional yep. model is a bit better. Yes. Do you get some short-term oscillations when applying your controller? Uh, do you do that? Or? That's a very good remark and very good observation, actually. I, I, I brushed over it because, <laughs> because of time and things we leave because I was already over time. Um, so yes, in the beginning, it's a bit worse because you have to initialize all the hidden variables of your LSTM. Mm -hmm. And so this takes a bit of time, which means that in the first few time steps, usually LSTMs don't perform that well. And then on the long term, they're really good. Whereas on the contrary, RC models are just usually there, and in, in our case at least, it's a one step ahead prediction model, mm -hmm. which means that the first time step will be right and then the second one would be right, and then you start having small errors that accumulates. So this is why in the beginning we are a bit worse than that. Um, <laughs> good observation. Okay, thank you. And, but uh, do you get then oscillations uh, due to the controller? Um, uh, sorry, oh, yeah, a, sorry. Um, yeah. We have oscillations that appear sometimes. So we mm -hmm. trained PCNNs with different random seats. Uh, usually over 10 seats you might have one or two that get oscillatory behavior in the beginning. Um, so, I mean, what we do usually is you just train over a few seats in any case to get yeah. uh, good performance for your neural networks and then you just check that you don't get oscillations. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, it's a, it's a really interesting approach. Um, can you clarify in the physical part of the physical neural network, um, you have some implied variables. Can you actually get those variables out of the model and see if they have any physical significance? Oh, you mean the, the, the parameters A, yeah. B, C, D? Um, yes. Um, so typically B would be related to the resistance of your wall, um, to the outside, so your external wall, and the capacitance of your room, right? which are typical variables um, when you model thermodynamics uh, physics uh, models. So yes, you can relate them. Um, we didn't so far uh, relate them to, to real quantities. And what you can see, for example, is if you look at, at this plot, you can see that they have quite similar dynamics, but for example, the temperature goes less high or like it, it stays lower for the PCNNs, which means that uh, it it has, the heating is less impact. Somehow, to fit the data better, it found a parameter where heating is less impact. Um, so this translates to lower resi uh, higher resistance of the heating system, for example. Thanks. Hi, thanks for the great talk. So you train your neural nets and your LSTM on data that you gathered from the baseline controller, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. from data that you gather while the building was running with a baseline controller. Do you expect maybe that sometimes your RL controller will move your, your, your building behavior in places where you never had data before? And then your LSTM might have, might have trouble generalizing. Yeah, um, thanks for the question. That's exactly actually what happens with classical LSTMs um, that you can see here. If you start moving the inputs around, because that's generated data, right? So we, we just took random control sequences and tried to, to match them, and you can see that the LSTM just doesn't react accordingly. But then we, we kind of solved this problem, and that's the, the sole purpose, in a sense, of PCNNs, to make sure that even if, if you do something that's not represented in your data, you get something physically meaningful out of it. So in, in, in that case, 
at least if you change the control inputs, because now we have consistency with respect to the control inputs, right? Because they, they are taken care of here in, in, in these parts. And since it, it's taken care of here, it's actually not going through the neural network, and you can control what's happening. So the same thing happens if you change the temperature in the neighboring rooms, or if you change the temperature outside, you're fine. You, you will have something consistent. Now, if you change one of the inputs that's still going through the LSTMs, there, you, I can't guarantee anything anymore. Okay, I see. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Does this work? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, could you go to slide 12? That one? Uh, yeah. So, the um, question Do you remember what uh, weather conditions you had during this recording? Not really. It was quite hot um, because it's in February, but the temperature, like, there was almost no heating um, required. So I know that it was quite hot and it was also quite sunny. And you can see it. Yeah. Uh, without heating, the temperature is just rising um, because of the sun that is just shining on the windows. Okay, thanks.